Do you know, I can't match the company's precise number, but layoffs in the range of 10,000 to 20,000 terminated employees at Google, Amazon, Facebook, and other tech companies have had an impact. It's also affecting other industries, but the tech sector in particular has undergone a significant series of layoffs. Consequently, people wonder why this hasn't reflected in the unemployment figures, given that the unemployment rate is approximately 3.5%, a level not observed since the 1960s. The Federal Reserve is closely observing this. They adhere to the Phillips curve, which is flawed scientific theory. The Phillips curve suggests an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. High unemployment leads to low inflation, and vice versa. So, according to this theory, to reduce inflation, one should expect an increase in unemployment. That's the Fed's belief. But what I've just mentioned is untrue. When considering a matrix of unemployment and inflation, what do we observe? In the late 1970s, there was high unemployment and high inflation. From 2009 to 2019, we witnessed low unemployment and low inflation. And presently, we have low unemployment accompanied by high inflation. So, every box in this matrix disproves any correlation. You can outline it, compute it, plot it on a chart, but there's no genuine correlation. The last time I assessed the Phillips curve, it was completely flat. In my education, curves were meant to be curved. Thus, it's flawed. Despite this, the Fed believes in it. Ultimately, it's not about my opinion. It's about the Fed's perspective, Harry. He perceived these low unemployment figures, comparable to the 1960s, as inflationary. According to them, those figures need to rise. However, aside from that, what else is the Fed overlooking? Wages have risen by 5% annually, or 5.2% on an annualized basis. However, the actual purchasing power of your wages has diminished, because when the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases wage figures, they are nominal figures. I'm not implying they're fabricated, but it's essential to recognize their nominal nature. Subtracting inflation reveals that real wages have been declining for a couple of years, hovering around an annualized decrease of 5%. Roughly speaking, it might sound like a 5% salary hike. What's the problem? Well, the reality is that your actual purchasing power is dwindling. It's not a robust indicator by any means. Moreover, the Fed intends to exacerbate this. They concur that these wage hikes are excessively high. However, in real terms, they are diminishing, and the Fed aims to further reduce them. If inflation is curbed and wages remain constant, real wages increase compared to previous levels. But when you're jobless, you don't have a wage. That's another predicament. What the Fed is neglecting, among many things, is something known as the labor force participation rate. Essentially, it involves the number of employed individuals divided by the total working age population. It's a simple calculation. Presently, this rate is around 61.2%, approximately. However, as recently as 2000, it was over 70%, and it has been declining ever since, especially plummeting during the 2020 pandemic lockdown. Understandably, it should never reach 100%. There are valid reasons for segments of the working age population not being employed, being a homemaker. Nonetheless, 70% is relatively high, and 60% is remarkably low, signaling a consistent downtrend, therefore, relative to a normalized figure. Approximately 8 to 10 million individuals between 25 and 54 years old are not part of the workforce. Even when accounting for legitimate reasons, there remains a substantial untapped labor pool. Many people are at home, engaged in leisure activities instead of seeking employment, which is concerning. To be categorized as unemployed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, one must actively seek employment. If one isn't looking for a job, they are not considered unemployed, but are still individuals capable of working. This inclination towards leisure, rather than employment, is a negative indicator. However, if this group were included in the unemployment figures according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics methodology, the unemployment rate would hover around 9%. Such a level of unemployment is reminiscent of a depression. Regarding the dollar, it experienced a surge throughout 2021 and most of 2022, reaching levels potentially exceeding those in 2000. However, it has declined marginally since October, but I believe this downtrend is nearing its end. 
and the dollar will strengthen once more. This assertion aligns with the broader economic context. If we are indeed entering the type of recession I have described and considering the yield curves, apart from their reliable recession indicators, let's examine the underlying reasons. We interpret these signals, but what's the real cause? The answer lies in the frantic demand for dollars. There's a significant shortage of dollars despite skepticism. People question, China is offloading treasuries, Brazil is doing the same, there's animosity towards the dollar, how can there be a dollar shortage? Nevertheless, evidence suggests otherwise. There's a reason behind it, the notional value of all off-balance sheet derivatives of banks and hedge funds worldwide is approximately one quadrillion, which is 1,000 trillion. These derivatives cover options, futures, swaps, swaptions, FX forwards, among others, yet they remain off the balance sheet, escaping conventional ratios. About 1% of this colossal sum is backed by collateral. The rest operates with minimal collateral. Therefore, in a credit crunch during a recession, when banks and clients of hedge funds assess the quality of collateral, they show reluctance towards mortgages, corporate assets, and even 10-year or 5-year treasury notes. They specifically demand treasury bills. 